scripture reading today is from Daniel chapter 1, verses 3 to 16. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of, the, of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the ro royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, the name Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel. But the official told Daniel, I'm, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the, ro the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. This is the word of God. Please be seated. Can we close our eyes and can we pray for a minute, please? Lord God, our Father in heaven, as we come to the time of the preaching of your word, we ask that this time belong to you, Father. Let my words be nothing, Lord, except that they give glory to you. Let it be word that only people hear you speaking to their hearts, Lord. Let my words be foolish so that people know your wisdom. Let me be clumsy and weak so that people know your strength. Let this time be yours, Father. Let it be you that speak to people's hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we've been talking about for some time, we've brought in the Gospel Project. This is a series that we're going to be having for the next three years in our Sunday school classes. And the sermons will be tuned to those classes, those Sunday school classes. So we've left the book of Acts, and right now we're going to be starting with the book of Daniel. As I started preparing this sermon, it really reminded me of when I first became Christian. You know what I wanted? When I first knew God was there and I first knew that God cared about me, all I wanted was to be alone and to pray. It was the greatest gift. All I wanted was to just be able to sit in a park or sit in a lounge or sit in a sofa, sit or stand and walk. And all I wanted was to pray. I didn't want anything else. I just wanted to be alone. Let everybody leave me alone and just let me pray. The thing is, we're not alone. It'd be nice to be left alone sometimes, but we're not. We have people, sometimes nice people, sometimes more difficult people. But even beyond that, we have situations in the world, great nations, conflicts going on, things that we can't control, things in the Middle East, things in America, things in Australia, things that are going on in China. We can't control them, but we're affected by them. And this is what's going on here, that these people who maybe would have just loved to be alone to worship with God, were affected by the people around them. The Israelites were surrounded by a number of great powers. The first most important one for a time was Egypt, located here, the Nile River. Extremely important, very powerful people. 
And after Egypt, you probably heard about the plagues, and you wondered, was this really true? Did this really happen? If you look in the history, there was what happened, what we call a collapse of civilization. Not just Egypt, but that whole Eastern Mediterranean world collapsed from very, very powerful kingdoms. Basically, they went back to almost village societies. The Egyptians, the Minoans in Crete, the Egyptians that are here collapsed. The Minoans in, Minoans in Crete, the Mycenaeans in Greece, the Hittites in Turkey, and the Canaanites. All of these kingdoms collapsed. And so as the Israelites left Egypt and went into the Promised Land and established, started establishing a kingdom, there wasn't that much opposition. The Philistines were the main ones you read about, and some people think they were the ones that caused this collapse because of their higher technology. But for a time, it was fairly simple. There was no much, not much, wasn't much opposition to building a kingdom. And so we read about the United Kingdom, Saul starting a kingdom, starting in 1050 BC, and then David, and then Solomon. And then it split. They started to have problems. Other people, other people always causes problems. It split into two tribes, into two groups. The north became Israel. The south became Judah, became two different countries. Israel with 10 tribes, Judah with two tribes. So it started to look like this. But they were still blessed with this period where they weren't facing a lot of opposition. Egypt was gone. All the great cultures, they had collapsed. There was no really powerful countries in this area. And then the empires came back. Sounds a bit like Star Wars, doesn't it? The empire returns. And Assyria was the first one. Assyria, with its capital up here in Nineveh, built this huge empire. And they conquered the northern kingdom in 722 BC. So when you read about the Assyrians, uh, sorry, not the Assyrians, the Samaritans, they were the people that were left in that area. They no longer really worshipped uh, God the way they were supposed to. They'd gone in a different direction. These were the Samaritans. But after a while, Assyria collapsed, and then Babylon. Located here between the rivers, the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. And that brings us to the story about Daniel, that we've been, the scripture we just read, about that time. They'd gone through this kingdom, and suddenly they were starting to be affected more and more by people around them. And we read what happened, how Babylon affected them. We read in Daniel chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, in the third year of the reign of Je uh, Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. So Judah was conquered. There were two times when they took away people, first in 597, but the real conquest, when the temple was destroyed, when the city was basically totally destroyed and the wall was knocked down, if you want to remember one date in Old Testament times, 586 BC is a central time for the Jews, for the Israelites, because everything was taken from them. And that was their situation. Everything was lost. Everything they had was gone. It'd be so nice to be alone and just pray and just be with God and just say, I just want to worship God. But they weren't in that situation. Everything. What was lost? The city. Jerusalem was gone. The people were gone. The temple was gone. That was all being destroyed. And then we read this passage in Daniel chapter 1, verses 3, verse 3 and 4. Then the king ordered Aspenaz, king of the chief of the royal of the court officials to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal families and the nobility. These were young men and they lost their families and their position. They were nobility. They were what we call dukes and princes and earls or something high ranking, some sort of high ranking people. But suddenly they were slaves. Everything had been taken away. They had lost everything. And then in verse four, Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude in every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. 
They lost their language. It was taken away from them. But they were taught another language and said, this is how you communicate. They were taught another literature, another culture, that this had all been taken away from them. Imagine what it's like to be Chinese and suddenly you can't speak Chinese, you can't read Chinese, You're, all the Chinese literature has been destroyed, all been taken away from you, and say, now you have to read Australian English. Very bad choice. <laughs> So be careful about having me up the front. <laughs> they lost everything. Language, culture. And what else? Verse 7. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel he gave the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. They even lost their names. That's how much had been taken away from them. They had names before when they were Jews. Daniel meaning judgment of God. Names that related to Yahweh, to the Jewish God. And now they were given other names. Belshazzar meaning who lays up treasures in secret because they believed in this secret religion. <laughs> that there was secrets in the religion. Whereas Christianity is a very open religion. What's in the Bible is what we teach. There are no secrets. But they had secret knowledge. Azariah, he who hears the Lord was changed to Abednego, servant of light, referring to their moon goddess that they prayed to. They were given new names, referring to different gods. And that was a special thing, because if we read Genesis chapter 2, verse 19, now the Lord God had formed, the be uh, formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was his name. To give a name is authority. We had the family up here doing the Advent reading this morning. You asked them who gave the names. It was the parents. It wasn't the children. Children didn't get any choice in it. Children didn't say, I want to be called Mary or Tom or David. The parents had authority and the parents said, this is your name. This is what you grow up with. And that's what they'd done. They'd taken away everything. They'd taken away their names. And what now? What else were they going to take away from them? We read Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. The king assigned to them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were trained for four year, three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. Doesn't sound too bad, does it? Food from the king's table. You offer me that? I'm, 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 that's a great idea. Good wine, good food, yeah, I'd love that. But they said no. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. The last thing that they wanted to hang on to was their relationship with their God. Because they had been given the law. And the law, one of the key things in it, was the law about what they were allowed to eat and what they weren't allowed to eat. Their dietary rules. And to break that, that was pretty much the last connection they had. And this was where they said, no, we can't do this. We still want that relationship. We still want to be obeying God. Even though everything had been taken away from the city, their families, their title, everything had been taken away from them. But they still said, no, we want this relationship to, to continue. This relationship with God, to not break that. And we read what happened. But the official told Daniel, I am afraid of the Lord my king, um, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should, you, why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would have my head because of you. And we read what happened. Verse 12, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. And the miracle. A miracle happened. At the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. Now, a lot of vegetarians will tell you this, that if you just eat vegetables, you're going to look better and you're going to be a lot healthier. I don't believe it. I think you need some meat. <laughs> and if you're a vegetarian here, please, that's not part of the sermon. I don't want to argue. <laughs> but basically, God blessed them. He said, you have tried to keep this connection by honoring the dietary rules. The same maybe as we try to keep the connection with our God by remembering what Jesus did with the Lord's Supper. 
Jesus coming into this world and saying, remember me by what you eat and what you drink, sharing together, praying before meals. And they honored their God, and he rewarded them by making them healthier and better nourished than any of the other young men. It brings up a key question, because we're all going to face times when we lose things. You might lose your job. You might lose your health. There might be war. You might lose your country. I don't know. I'm not making any predictions. But the world, we don't live alone. We live in a complicated situation. Economic problems, health problems, financial problems. So many things can go on and so many things that you can lose. So many things that can be taken away from you. Your health, your security, your house your family, so many things that can be taken away from you. And as Christians, we have to think about it, how to deal with that, because it is a reality that we may face now in our lives, that you may be going through something now, and perhaps in the future, it will become more difficult. Perhaps there will be a future time when we will have to make the same set of decisions. These young men had to decide something what are we? When everything has been taken away from you, when you've lost everything, even your name, what are we? And they had to answer that question. They had to look at it and say, how do we answer? What are we? I could say I'm Australian. Is that what I am? But I care about you more than my own country. That's why God put me here. I could say I'm a man, but the sisters in this church are very precious to God. They're very important to God. And we share a relationship in this family. We share something. What are we? What makes us different? Even when everything else has been taken away, what is the core? What is central to us? What makes us what we are? We are what we believe. We believe in God. And we believe that Jesus sent his son Jesus, Jesus into this world to die for us. And because we accepted that, we believe that we are God's. And nothing can ever take that away from us. Not sickness, not financial trouble, not even death. Nothing can take that away from you because that is what you are. Hold on to what you believe. Through the most difficult times, you are what you believe. We are what we do. They decided they wouldn't eat the food. What you do has a huge effect on what you are. If you say, yes, I'm Christian, but I'm going to go home and watch pornography on the internet, or yes, I'm Christian, but I'm going to go out and steal things or cheat people, it will affect your life. And what you are maybe isn't what God wants you to be. You are what you believe. You are what you do. And particularly in those times of trouble that these men, young men went through, you are what you hold on to. That you say, never will I let it go. When I was 24, I started going to church a little bit. I wasn't baptized. I read the Bible a little bit. I started becoming Christian a little bit. <laughs> and then I fell away. The pastor moved on, went to another church. We got another pastor in. I didn't like him very much. So I left the church, just stopped going to that church. And I fell away. Fourteen years later, when I was 38 years old, a voice spoke to me and said, turn to God. And then I came back. And after a little while, I started to fall away again. I could feel it, my drifting away. But I remembered. I remembered that experience when I was 24. You are what you hold on to. And I said, God had given me this, and I will hold on to this, and I will never let it go. No matter what the difficulty is. No matter what things happen that hurt me. No matter what I don't understand. Never will I let it go because God has promised never will he leave me. 
and he promises you the same. Never let go of what you believe. Never let go of that faith in Christ. Watch your thoughts, what is going on in your heart, because they become the words that you will speak. Watch the words, because they start to reflect your actions, what you will do. Watch your actions, because they become habits, things you start to do every day. Watch your habits, because they become your character, what sort of person you are. Watch your character, because that becomes your destiny. Every one of you needs to answer the question in your heart, what are we? What am I? It's what you believe. That's what you really are. It's not the BMW you drive. It's not the car. It's not the job. It's what you are, is what you believe, what you do, what you hold on to. These are the important things. Can we close our eyes and let's pray for a minute? Lord God, our Father in heaven, we are yours. We belong to you, Lord. Lead us to have strength, even through the most difficult times, the challenges that are in this life, Lord. Lead us to hold on to that, what we are, what we believe, that we believe in you, and you, Father, are ours, and we are yours, and we belong to you. Let us hold on to what we do, Father. Let us be careful to do only things that give glory to you, Father. And let us hold on to our faith and never let it go. Never, never will we let it go. The same as you said, never will you leave us. Let us always be yours today, tomorrow, and always into eternity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.